Good late afternoon, good early evening, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the IIA. It's a pleasure to have an audience here before me in Dublin, and uh, also to those joining online, a very sincere welcome. We're delighted to be joined by RT's Paul Cunningham, uh, who's been very generous to take time out of his schedule at this time of year, Christmas, of course, but also just a very busy reporting schedule. So it's really great. We're trying to pin Paul down for some time, so it's great it's finally come together. Paul is going to speak as ever for about 20 minutes in a moment about his experiences reporting most recently from the conflict in in Gaza from his uh, from his vantage in Tel Aviv, as he's going to tell us in a moment, but also about his experience as a, an accomplished and uh, indeed an, an award-winning journalist. As ever, those of you who wish to participate in the discussion here before me, when we get to the right moment, you can just put up your hand and a microphone will come to you. And for those of you who are joining us online, as ever also, if you wish to participate with a question, please use the uh, question function on uh, on Zoom that you should see on your screens. Quick reminder that the discussion today, as ever, is on the record. And if you wish to participate uh, on X or Twitter, please use the handle at IIEA. I'm going to very briefly introduce Paul before handing over to him. Paul Cunningham is a political correspondent for RTE News, Ireland's national broadcaster. Previously, Paul was Europe correspondent based in Brussels an environment correspondent. Paul has, rep has reported for more than 50 countries around the world, including from war zones and also from natural disasters. A documentary maker and author, he has won multiple awards for his work. And in 2023, Paul has reported from Ukraine, Israel, and the West Bank. Paul, thanks again for being with us, and the floor is yours. My Thanks very much for your invitation and uh, the possibility of speaking on possibly the most contentious issue facing us. I was hoping for maybe something a little bit safer. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is the difficulties of reporting um, on the Israel-Gaza war. And the most difficult aspect of this is that I wasn't in Gaza. Um, I wasn't allowed to enter. And really when it comes down to it, that is sort of the gold standard for journalism to be able to go in an eyewitness, to see what's happening, to be able to interrogate both sides to a conflict and to be able to respond in a... Um, in an as open way as possible about what you see, how to articulate it. And that wasn't possible. We didn't get the chance to go and see those buildings pancaked. We didn't go to see the hospitals and the morgues. We weren't able to interrogate people about what was being said. And I think um, one of the things we have to do is to ask why. Why is it the case that the international media was not allowed to do the job that it wanted to do and was kept outside when the conflict is raging? And we now believe that as many, or it seems to be heading towards nearly 20,000 people death, the dead, the majority of them men and women. Um, some of the international news organizations, we were just talking about this earlier on, um, like BBC and Fox News have been allowed to travel into Gaza, but it's under strict conditions. They travel in with the Israeli defense forces. They're told where to go. And the uh, material that they produce is also vetted by the IDF. And this type of embedded journalism, to my mind, is no substitute for what is required, which is unfettered access by the media so that they're able to do their job. Um, the journalists inside Gaza themselves, mostly local Palestinians, are doing an incredible job in trying to work under very extreme circumstances. Um, and I think it's worth sort of underlining this fact, because according to the Committee to Protect Journalists in its most recent report, um, it says, and that's an independent body advocating on behalf of media workers, it says that um, 63 journalists have been killed so far, and um, 56 of them are Palestinian, four of them are Israeli, and three of them are Lebanese. Now, on top of that, if you go to their website, it also indicates that it believes other journalists are dead, it hasn't verified them, others are missing, and some are arrested or detained, and it's continuing to try to get to the bottom of just exactly how many media workers are in trouble. And I think it's probably worth mentioning a few names. Um, if you go to October the 7th, the Committee to Protect Journalists um, names Yanov Zohar, Aliet Aran and Shai Regev. These were three Israeli journalists who were killed, um, one in, in a kibbutz and the other two at the Nova Festival. Um, the following day, a Palestinian journalist, Assad Shamlak, was killed along with nine members of his family in an Israeli airstrike in southern Gaza. So journalists were being targeted almost immediately. This is um, what was happening. If they weren't targeted, certainly they were being killed anyway. There are clear and significant risks to reporting from Gaza, and I think we all sort of take account of that, but journalists are 
not just civilians, they're also specialists. And what they're trying to do is to work in very extreme circumstances to do what they want to do, which is to inform, to educate and try and throw some light on a very difficult and complicated situation. And that is um, underlined and enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 19 states, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference, and to seek, receive, impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. Now, one of those journalists who is um, working under that uh, difficult situation is a contact of mine, a man called Mohammed, and he has regularly provided material to us, which we then use in our reports. And anytime I message him, it's a difficult situation because I'm never quite sure if he's going to reply because there is a grave possibility that he's going to be killed. In advance of this meeting, I just decided to contact him again and said, are you OK? And what he responded was by saying, I'm still fine. Thank you for your question. I hope this war will end as soon as possible. And as we're sitting here tonight and people watching online, Mohammed is still out there somewhere in Khan Yunus, which is the epicenter of the Israeli military attack at the moment. And once again, we don't know if he's going to be OK. I sometimes see comments um, online saying, well, why aren't you in Gaza? Or you should be in Gaza. And the Sky News correspondent Alex Crawford said during the week that it's absolutely ridiculous for anyone to peddle the myth that journalists are not in Gaza doing their job on account of being too afraid or too scared. The fact is that we are not allowed to be in Gaza. And that is coming down to a decision by both Israel and Egypt to seal the borders. So that is why we are not in there, because we're not allowed to be there. Um, Cameraman Owen Corkin and I, that was the team of journalists from RT who went to Gaza and we arrived a few days after um, October the 7th. And it's worth restating that in that attack by Hamas, 1,200 people were massacred. Around 240 hostages were abducted and hidden in Gaza, men and women, children and the elderly. And a week of mourning was in operation when we were there, everything was closed down. All of the television stations were reflecting on the horror of what had happened in southern Israel. And um, Tel Aviv is a coastal city. And I remember walking out onto the beach on the first night and just looking south. And that was, you know, around 80 kilometers down the road is Gaza, an hour's drive. And one was wondering um, what was going to happen to the 2.3 million people as a result of what had taken place on October the 7th. My aim, as much as possible, because we weren't in Gaza, was to try and make direct contact with people who were there. And that's how we were trying to work around this issue. We weren't in Gaza, but we wanted to talk to people in Gaza or hear from them. One of the opportunities we have is international news agencies like Reuters, like Agents, Agents France Press, AFP, because they have Palestinian journalists who are able to give us information. Some of the major um, humanitarian organizations like the World Health Organization, the United Nations, they had people and were supplying statements. We had organizations like Oxfam who had staff members there who were posting messages about what their life was like, what was happening there. We also had people from Médecins Sans Frontières, which is independent and partial, and it was setting up Zoom co uh, contacts and meetings with journalists to allow them to know what was happening in their hospital and um, what was the death toll, what were the circumstances, what were their medical supplies. So that was giving us some information about what we were doing. One of the most controversial aspects of it um, was a daily update we received from what was called the Gaza Health Ministry. And that would tell you about the civilian death toll that was building. And um, it's controversial because um, it is Hamas controlled because it's operating inside Gaza and Hamas controls Gaza. And this was something that um, the Israelis would continually say, if it is controlled by Hamas, it is propaganda. On that, on that basis, what you can't do is take it as fact. But what we saw um, clearly over the course of the weeks was the statistics being used by um, the UN OCHA, which is sort of the humanitarian office within Gaza, was tracking um, what the figures were saying coming from um, the Gaza Health Ministry. I think it's also worth saying is that from a media point of view, we were saying that had we been allowed to be in Gaza, that we would have been in those hospitals. We would have been able to vet that information that was being supplied, but we were being kept out from Gaza. And this was part of the difficulties in the fog of war. How do you evaluate? How do you work it through? Um, social media platforms obviously can be of huge help. And um, we were able to pick up what individual politicians are saying. And we were able to hear from uh, 
people outside of the country, from journalists around the uh, the theatre of the conflict. So that was very important. But as we know, social media can be both helpful and it also can be confusing. And it's worth interrogating that. There's two elements to it. One is the misinformation where um, people are getting things wrong, not out of maliciously, but that is then sort of reproduced and it becomes um, sometimes fact. And then you've also got bad actors who are deliberately going out to try and confuse or they're using it as a polemic or to propagate um, their view on whatever has just happened. And that becomes a real, real problem. And the political theorist Hannah Ardent adroitly observed in 1974, if everybody always lies to you, the consequence is not that you believe the lies, but rather that nobody believes anything any longer. And uh, my former colleague, uh, Mark Little, often talks about this issue. He's a um, former RT, now works in so the question of fighting misinformation and disinformation currently with Kinzen. And he uses a quote which actually comes from, or is at least attributed to Mark Twain. And he says, a lie can go around the world before the truth is time to put its boots on. And it gives you an insight into that fact of we have to try and vet something, to interrogate it, to assess it, to size it up and to be able to give some read on it. Whereas this other stuff is churning, rolling constantly. And in a fast moving um, situation, that's really, really complicated. While trying to sift through a welter of information, one of the other things we were trying to do was just to manage time. I was getting up around 7.30 a.m. And that would have been 5.30 a.m. Irish time to try and prepare a brief report for Morning Ireland and also do a long interview. We would finish up around half 11 local time because that would be just after the nine o'clock news as well. But that's only the bookend. In between, you had three radio programmes, Morning Ireland, News at One, Drive Time. You would have headlines on the hour every hour. You had three television programmes, the one o'clock, the six o'clock and nine o'clock. You also had additional things like prime time from time to time. You would also then have the 24-7 social media beast, uh, which wants everything all of the time. Um, and that would be individual clips, different interviews, tweets, or long um, analysis pieces as well. So it really was something which was incredibly intense to do because each outlet was looking for something that was a little bit different. Um, I think it's also worth uh, saying that Part of the information we were receiving was also coming from the Israeli side. We would have, once you signed on to the government press office, you could onto a WhatsApp group called Swords of Iron, which is the name that they've given the military campaign. You're getting updates from the prime minister, from the defense minister. You're getting invitations to briefings. You were also getting um, briefings from the Israeli defense forces in the morning and the night. So you were trying to assimilate all of that information and include it in what your reports. And on top of that, what we were trying to do was to generate our own material as well. And um, whether it was talking to Tom Hand, the um, Dunleary born man, whose uh, daughter Emily at that time he believed had been killed by Hamas, but we now know and uh, was actually being held hostage. So to move to Galilee or the Dead Sea and to come back to Tel Aviv or to move to Jerusalem to try and get into the West Bank, once you were moving, you weren't reporting and <laughs> you were getting an awful lot of um, into difficult situations because there was such a demand for the actual material we're doing. One thing I found very quickly, almost immediately, was that the Israeli view of Ireland's politicians and media when it came to this particular conflict um, was ankle high. And I remember being at one particular protest in relation to um, hostage families and their supporters. And I was standing to the side and a man came over to me and said, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Ireland. And he said immediately, you're not with us. And there is that sense that we are in somehow blinded by our support for the Palestinian cause not to see the righteousness of their um, case. And uh, I pointed out that the Taoiseach Leo Varadkar had condemned what had happened um, on October the 7th unreservedly, unqualified, that our Thonista Deputy Prime Minister had um, repeatedly said that Israel had the right to defend itself. But um, they just viewed it as words. They didn't believe that we actually meant it and certainly didn't feel that the Irish media was in any way representative of where they were coming from, understood it or even wanted to understood it either. Um, at the core of it, I think, and this is probably what comes down to, is the difference between um, the Irish government, the Israeli government, the Irish people and the Israeli people, is that from the Israeli perspective that we have skipped over uh, too quickly what happened on um, October the 7th. And they feel that uh, we don't take into account the living and ongoing horror of the hostages' families that Hamas could release them tomorrow but chooses not to, whether they're um, 
children or whether they are, are, are adults. Um, and one person said to me that, uh, and this was an Israeli, said that three and a half thousand people died in the Irish conflict over 30 years. They lost one third of that number in just one day. And they don't believe that we take that on board and how we um, articulate it. Um, I think if the, the central fault line comes back to that, uh, and I think it's interesting that, you know, from the Irish government's point of view, is that the key phrase it continues to use is that um, it believes that Israel has to be proportionate in its actions um, in Gaza. Um, and that proportional word is important because it relates to international humanitarian law. And what follows from that is if you're not being proportionate, then you're breaking international law, although the Irish government doesn't usually state that, but it builds up to that point and you can see what they're actually saying. Um, and I think it was interesting, sort of, you can see the um, strength of the comments from the Irish government increasingly being that case. And one of them sort of stand out one came from Tisha Gleav Raikar when he said, what I'm seeing unfolding at the moment isn't just self-defense. It looks resembles something more than approaching revenge. That's not where we should be. And I don't think how Israel will, that's how Israel will guarantee future freedom and future security. And that isn't just my analysis. We've saw it when uh, Michal Martin has tarnished to visited Sederot, which is in Southern Israel, uh, an Israeli town that was overrun by Hamas and 50 people were killed. And he went into a meeting with the mayor and the mayor immediately said, are you here to support us? And from that, he talked about what life was like in the town under a rocket attack. And he came back and likened Hamas to ISIS and said that if we don't deal with them now, you're going to be facing it. And Michal Martin said, he said, we call for ceasefire in Gaza on humanitarian grounds because we believe the scale of the death and destruction is too high. And I have to say that. And Mayor uh, Alon Devity said, I will say to my prime minister to stop the war. If Ireland can promise me that five days after five days, all the weapons of Hamas has in Gaza and all the armies of Hamas go outside Egypt or someplace. And I think it sort of comes to that point where the Irish believe that the only way you're going to get out of this is through some form of political settlement. And at the moment where Israel is, that there is a military solution. And after that point, we will begin to talk about it. And it seemed to me that to crystallize it was that the Israeli view was that what happened on October 7th can never happen again. And on that basis, they have to crush Hamas. And there is nothing after that. That's just it. And that's the thing where it seems to me that that policy endures even when 1.8 million Gazans are forced from their homes, when nowhere in Gaza is safe, when the death toll heads remorselessly towards 20,000, a majority of them women and children. It endures despite entities like MSF, that's Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borgers, say, saying Israel's military operation is brutal collective punishment and demanding that forcible displacement ends, assaults on hospitals and healthcare facility ends, indiscriminate attacks end, the blockade on food, water, medical supplies and fuel ends, and MSF is demanding all that happens immediately. And yet, the Israeli view endures. It endures when journalists are targeted. According to Human Rights Watch, the Reuters journalist Islam Abdallah was killed in southern Lebanon after two Israeli strikes, injuring six other reporters. And Human Rights Watch found no military target nearby. The journalists were clearly identifiable and Human Rights Watch concluded it was a deliberate act, attack on civilians and constituted a war crime. It has to be said, Israel denies that charge and says that an investigation is underway. And it also endures when Israel is being accused of carrying out genocide against the Palestinian people. At the UN Security Council meeting last weekend, the Palestinian ambassador, Riyad Mansour, said, when you refuse to call for a ceasefire, you're refusing to call for the only thing that can put an end to the war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. And despite 90 states, as we know, backing the Euro United Arab Emirates demand for an immediate ceasefire, it was vetoed. And I think it's worth just spending some time on this issue of genocide and only be speaking for a few more minutes and um, because sometimes journalists are asked to call out why don't you say this is genocide why aren't you saying what is happening on the ground uh, and the short answer is that it's a legal determination it's not the opinion of a journalist as to whether or not genocide is taking place or not but it reminds me of 2004 when i was reporting from darfur and at that time around 1.8 million people had been displaced 
The death toll was around 70,000 and a quarter of a million people had fled from Darfur into neighbouring Chad. And the UN Security Council announced a special investigation into this charge of genocide. It had a five-member tribunal reported back very after about four or five months. And it said that it couldn't say genocide was taking place, even though there'd been a huge expectation that that was the case. And it said it was because it couldn't prove there was intent. There were clearly people killed. There was clearly people displaced. They clearly had all of those stats and figures, but they couldn't prove intent. And intent is a key issue in that. And it just illustrates how um, journalists have to be very careful about what they say when something isn't necessarily straightforward. I mean, a few years, uh, um, 10 years before that, I'd been to Bosnia and reported from the war zone there. Um, no one believed in 1995 when Ratko Mladic was indicted on genocide that it would ever happen. In 2011, it did happen. He was detained and brought to The Hague, and I was there. The following year, his trial started. I was there and reported from it. And 2017, he was found guilty of genocide in relation to Srebrenica. But there was a second genocide charge, which didn't proceed, which once again just underlines that difficulty that we have. There's one last point. It was just we were trying to travel to the West Bank, and on one occasion, we went in with Bihal Martin, the Tornishta, um, and it was great because we were able to get access to Ramallah. But it was interesting that the Palestinian Authority um, leaders didn't want to speak to us. Um, we put in the request. Um, they didn't reply, which is uh, something I don't quite understand as to why that was the case. Um, so we left and we spoke to some people on the ground who, who once again were saying that they feel this has been going on for too long and that they want to find some way um, that peace can uh, endure because they're tired of living in a war zone for the past 75 years. Just to sum up then, and I think it's a key thing for me, is that you know we were precluded from being able to independently verify what was happening inside Gaza. And it means you continuously have to attribute what people say rather than being able to say it yourself. I saw, I witnessed, this is my understanding, at least from the limited part um, that you can see. And, and that was a, a real problem. And I know that there's a huge interest in these conflicts. And I, I think that I was in Ukraine earlier on this year, and uh, I don't think I've seen as much interest in 30 years of journalism in both those conflicts in relation to Ukraine and Palestine. And yet at the same time, I think we have to be um, straight with people that there's times when we didn't know and weren't able to say that we know because we weren't there. And that is um, something we have to be honest with you. And one last thing, I know that when Owen Corkin and myself were getting on the plane and we were heading over to Israel, we were saying to each other, no matter what we do in this, and no matter what we report, we're likely to be getting one hell of a criticism from not one or other or probably both anyway. Um, but that was something we were prepared to do. Thank you.